But uh, today I want to talk to you about something other than that. Um, you know, I want to talk to you about the, what happens when you're in prison for a while is uh, your world shrinks and um, freedom becomes a distant abstraction. Freedom stops being the most pressing issue, you know, after you've been in for a while. Um, what matters most is the day-to-day. -day. Exercise, reading, connection with the outside, connection with other prisoners on the inside, and the knowledge that, that we, we aren't forgotten, that people are fighting for us out here. And I learned very quickly in prison that we would receive almost no improvements in our conditions unless we fought for them. And then I learned that my ability to stay sane didn't only depend on my humane conditions. What was making me survive was the fight itself to get those conditions. And I, I remember one of the times that I felt most alive in the, my 26 months in Iranian prison. Sarah had been, re been released months before and Josh and I were receiving almost no letters. And you have to understand that this isn't a small issue. A prisoner's greatest fear is being forgotten. Letters are a prisoner's connection to a bigger world, a world in which people actually care about them. Josh and I went on hunger strike. It was the only weapon we had, and it was one that felt like a gamble. We wondered if they would separate us, put us back in solitary confinement like they had threatened to. Uh, we wondered if they would take our books away. Days into the hunger strike, our interrogator came. He played the usual game, separating Josh and I, and speaking to us separately as if we were being interrogated. We were blindfolded. He told me my hunger strike was useless, that it wouldn't go anywhere, but I didn't give in. Then in the end, he told me that if I ate right at that moment, and believe me, I wanted to eat at that moment more than I wanted to read a letter. If I would eat at that moment, then he would give me letters from my mom and dad. He held the letters out in front of me. My heart leapt and I paused. Then I said no. I told him I needed letters from my parents, my sisters, and from Sarah. That was our demand and I was sticking to it. I got up and walked blind blindfolded back to my cell. Ten minutes later, he came to our cell door. He told us that they would give us all the letters we demanded. And after he closed the door and walked away, Josh and I were punching the air in excitement and we were dancing. It felt like we had slain Goliath. Against all odds, we won something. At that moment, we weren't only bodies in a cage, we were human. But the biggest victories came when there was pressure from the outside. Prisons function on the ability to completely control a small self-contained world. But when that world stops being self-contained, when people inside are coordinated with people outside, that system of control falls apart. When our families and Sarah publicly hunger struck on the outside in solidarity with us on the inside, we start receiving all of our letters. We got a phone call and books from our families came without delay and then we got free. This movement, this Occupy movement needs to permeate the prisons. God forbid one day some of the people here will be on the other side of this fence. But when movements get strong, people start getting locked up. We should know this. This happens in every country. Prisons are the places where movements are killed. But at the same time, when a movement truly permeates prisons, a, a space built to break people down, the movement is at its strongest. This is true all over the world. And the Occupy movement will only begin to gain, gain strength in prisons when people on the outside are helping to bring about changes on the inside. When prisoners start getting exercise equipment, when they have access to all the reading material they need, when they get classes, when they get more visits with friends and family, when their demands are met, and when people start getting out of the shoe. In prison, conditions are everything. As my conditions improved, as I was able to sleep in a bed, drink a cup of coffee, have showers daily, I stood taller, I became bolder. Many people here today helped me do that when I was locked up halfway around the world. I know that we can do that for the people locked up right here. Thanks.
We stand outside what's called the California Department of Corrections. We all know that's BS. We all know that this is a place of dehumanization. How do they expect people to be correct in this place? It's a place we hear about strip searches. We hear about, we hear about always feeling, in prison you always feel like you're being watched. You're interrogated, you're insulted, you're being, you're raped. Lots of different things happen in prison that is dehumanizing, has nothing to do with corrections. Other prisoners beat you down. And one of the biggest things they do is send you into solitary confinement. In Iran, for political prisoners, the first thing they do is put you in solitary. And they separate you, not make you, make you feel forgotten, make you feel disconnected. They were always telling us, oh no, you're not getting letters, your families have forgotten about you. No, they're not writing to you. It's, we would give them to you, but um, they forgot. So that's how, that's, that's how it is on the inside, is a department of fear. It has nothing to do with the Department of Corrections. It's an attempt to make us scared, make you scared on the inside. But it's the same here on the outside, that prisons serve the function of a fear. They serve the function of trying to make us scared, that if you do this or do that, they throw you in prison. In Iran, where we were, we were there just two, less than two months after the biggest protest their government had ever seen. So when ideology couldn't hold their people anymore, they threw them in prison. When ideology can't hold them, they resort to terror. And you see the American prisons have been growing for decades. It's been the last resort. Resorting to terror, resorting to mass incarceration. And so if we're going to stand up, I want to echo what Shane said, that we need to outside and inside, that we need to stand up together. And we need to commit together to keep going. So I want a quick, I want a quick mic check. Standing outside the Department of Fear. Standing outside the Department of Fear. I will no longer fear. I will no longer fear. Even though I've been in prison. Even though I've been in prison. And know how hard and dehumanizing it is. And know how hard and how systems can make human nature to take can make human nature so ugly at times. So ugly at times. But I am strong. But I am strong. And we together are strong. And we together are strong. And we don't want to go to prison. And we don't want to go to prison. But I will stand up for justice for prisoners on the inside and outside. Forever. Forever. Hey, everybody. One of the five core demands um, of the statewide prison hunger strike that started last summer in, in Pelican Bay was to end the practice of isolating some prisoners for more than 22 hours a day. To end the strike, uh, the state of California agreed to review this inhumane practice. Now, nearly six months later, not much has changed. Many prisoners around the state and here at San Quentin are still stuck in the daily hell of solitary confinement. I myself experienced 14 and a half months of solitary confinement as a political hostage in Iran. And after just two months, my mind began to slip. I would spend large portions of my day crouched down by a small slot in my door, listening for any sounds from the outside that might distract me from the sheer terror of my isolation. I suffered from insomnia, nightmares, extreme emotional det detachment, and violent panic attacks. More than once during my imprisonment, I completely lost control began screaming and beating at the walls until my knuckles bled. Human beings are social creatures. We depend on each other for strength and we depend on each other for our sanity. In the US, we have the highest per capita prison population in the world and more people in solitary than any country on the planet. Our prison, our prison system uses solitary confinement 
confinement as a routine administrative practice instead of the very last recourse, which is what it should be. I, I recently finally got to read Nelson Mandela's Long Walk Home, his autobiography, about his 29 years in prison. Mandela spent two weeks in solitary confinement and he said it was the most dehumanizing experience that he had to go through in almost three decades of imprisonment. If Nelson Mandela's soul was being violated after two weeks, how can people in places like this endure decades of isolation? Prolonged, indefinite solitary confinement is psychological torture. The practice should be banned by the UN, and our country, as the greatest um, violator of this, and user of this practice, should take a leading role in its eradication. I've been told that the Pelican Bay hunger strikers, that some prisoners have been um, given small improvements in their conditions, like sweatsuits and wall calendars and pull-up bars. These things are important. Every small improvement is important to a prisoner. But this is clearly not enough. We need to join forces with prisoners inside, and a good way to do that is to join this campaign that someone mentioned earlier um, for 150,000 calls to our local legislature. Um, we need to flood the lines, and you can find out more about this at Prisoner Hunger Strike Solidarity at WordPress.com, and the green flyers are being circulated. So the prison officials say they need more time to end solitary confinement, to to create these improvements. I say we need to keep the pressure on and we need to end solitary confinement now. Woo!